And it's been providing us with fantastic data. We're really excited about it. Um, these are, this willow is turquoise, Vicky's green, Maureen's red, Lobelia's purple, and Ida's blue. And this is the dry season, so there's differences in Ambicelli from dry season to wet season. Now, the, uh, the MBs, who are Maureen's group, they go across the border into Tanzania, in fact, uh, quite a lot, and we worry a bit about them when they're over here. And um, Willows, uh, Winnie's family, Willow's family, the WAs, uh, stay right in the middle of the of the park during the dry season, as did Vicky. Well, she went a little tiny bit, and then Ida and Lobelia seemed to follow each other around. <laughs> you know? So that was the, that was pretty much the scene. You know, they go out sometimes go out at night. See, so Ida and Lobelia go go across the boundary of the park. They go out toward the this is Kilimanjaro. They go out toward Kilimanjaro at night, but then come back down in the daytime. But then, then here's the wet season, and you see how important the outer areas are. Vicki, she's the most, and the VAs, because we've had callers on them before, are the most amazing. I mean, look at, she goes right up, way up there, to a, another little, a little uh, sanctuary up there. And sometimes she goes fast, because here this is an hour difference, these two points, so she's really moving. And uh, the MBs were completely in Tanzania. They didn't go back into Kenya during the wet season, during this part, this, these times. And then Willow leaves and went west and went right out of the park and out this way. And Lobelia and Ida weren't in the park at all as, as well. They were just out. And so this, we see that this area is terribly important and it's got a lot of people in it. So this is a problem area for us because we know the elephants use it a lot and yet it's sort of building up. We're not so worried about this area or this or this one, but we can see that we're going to have to do something here to try to get corridors. There's a corridor on the, on the Tanzanian side, but not on the Kenyan side. So we have to try to do so. So it's really been so valuable to us to, to know where they're going. And, and how to how to try to plan with with our own organization plus other NGOs that are working in Amasalia, and then we can we can show them it's so good. We, we before we could just say, well, we know they go such and such, but now we can just show on a map. Look what we have to do here in these places. So so we were we were pleased with that and pleased with the knowledge that we were getting and that the. Drought had broken, and the um, and that the uh, the poaching had gone down. But we also wanted, to, and I don't I don't have pictures to show you this, but I just want to tell you that we we started a new study last January on social disruption of the elephants. We got um, a young scientist from from uh, England, Vicky Fishlock, to start a study on how those fa the families have responded to. All those losses, particularly those families that lost their matriarchs, and a lot of there was one. Some of the families lost seven adult females. I mean, it just takes away so much, and we're trying to see, you know, how they how they cope with it, you know, who takes over, how it's done, how their 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 reproductive success or failure will be over the next four or five years to see how they uh, how they're doing, you know, whether they can deal with it, how, you know, this is catastrophic loss for them, so we're, we, we took advantage of that unfortunate event to really look at something important with, with the elephants. And, um, whoops, this is the beginning of some of our information that we're getting. Uh, the drought ended in January 2010. Elephants had the 22-month gestation period. So we had to wait two years before we knew what, you know, whether they, the elephants had conceived and how long it took them to recover after the grass you know, started growing again. And uh, basically all, almost all the females were available to become pregnant. There were um, 
the few that were bought at calves that had calves in 2009 uh, were probably not available, but all the ones from 2008, and that we lost, um, I think there was 151 calves born in 2008, only 41 survived. They, they really did very badly. So uh, anyway, so all those females who lost their calves could be, who could breed. All the females whose calves had been born in say 2006, 2007 could breed. And all the young females who reached sexual maturity at, you know, at 12 or 13, they could breed. So we, we, we were fairly sure we were gonna have a baby boom, but we, we never expected it to be quite as, as uh, amazing as it has been. So um, we had no, we had one calf born in all of 2011. Just it was just you know that I don't know how she managed because that means she conceived in 2009 and managed to keep the calf alive, uh, keep the calf you know as in her pregnancy. And um, anyway, on October 12, 2011, the first calf was born after after the drought. That was conceived. We knew it was conceived in uh, in, in in December, January of uh, 2010. And this is Kumquat, one big old big female, and that was she was the first to give birth. And then the baby started raining out of the sky. <laughs> they. Uh, this is the second one. This was Angelina's calf, and uh, neither of those are Angelina. Those are. Allo mothers or babysitters who take care of um, the calves. And they were so beside themselves with excitement about these calves because they hadn't had any calves to take care of. They probably even forgot what little calves were like. So these little uh, 10, you know, eight year old females you know, who aren't mature yet, that's their job is to take care of little calves. And they were they were just you know so excited when the, when the calves came, as were we. <laughs> This is Begoria and her beautiful big, big, born that day, which was a big calf. Wow. And this is one of our most beautiful females. This is Theodora, who I write about a lot in Elephant Memories. And she's a big old female, but she, she's huge. She has the biggest tusks I've ever seen on a female. And she's had a little male calf. And that's Ebony, and that's um, Echo's, uh, grandson there, Ebony's calf, and I think that's an Odessa and her calf, and her, oh no, I know who this, no, it wasn't Odessa, this was, this was sort of what happens to these young guys, these, this was um, Ismay and her brand new calf, and that is Ismay's older calf, who, who had his mother all to himself for, <laughs> for a long time. And, uh, it, you know, they, they get, you can see how <laughs> sort of disturbed they are. Here's this new calf, and so he, they, come, they get extra cuddly. <laughs> Especially when they're males. You know? The females seem to accept it and get so excited. But the males, you come and lean on their mother. And they're like, so you haven't forgotten me, have you? No. So the dynamics is, are fun in, in watching all the things that go on. Yeah, so this was Ismay and... I forgot what his name is, but and that's Ebony again with her beautiful calf. And this was Odessa, sorry, and her calf. Anyway, these are just wonderful. We we have had so much fun being with these families. I just wanted to share the baby pictures with you. I mean, so, some families have as many as ten calves, and I, it's just so delightful. It's just so renewing for us who went through that drought and watched all those calves you know, and those adults dying, to be able to go out and, and sit with a family that is so taken with these calves, all, everybody's excited and, and, um, and they're all, you know, trying to take care of the calves and the calves are having so much fun, they get, they, they're so playful, they're all fat and healthy because we've had good rain. This was another little calf, it was very silly. <laughs> And then, uh, then on top of all that, we've had two albino, albino calves, um, and which we've never had in the, in the 40 years of, of the study. I don't know 
what's happened. So this is, um, you can see he's got, now his skin isn't completely white, I guess, but anyway, he's, his hair is all white. You see his white tail hairs? That's what color it should be. The ear hair, and he's quite pink. He's very pink. It's so hard to see his eye, but we think, we, we don't really quite know what color the eye is yet. So first, um, yeah, he, there he is. He's very healthy. We, he was born and he's about four months old now. He doesn't seem to be having any trouble. And the other one lives way out on the western side. We, we've only seen him once or twice and haven't been able to get a picture. But this was bright excitement. We'd never had an albino calf before. And this is, uh, this is the oldest female in the pop, the only one of the few who didn't die. She's about 64 herself, and this is, she stopped breeding several years ago, and maybe that's one of the reasons she survived, just because she hadn't, didn't have to produce any milk. Anyway, this, she's with her granddaughter here. So everybody takes care of the calves, and there's another aloe mother taking care of us. It's not her calf, she's taking care of it. And it's all reassurance and touching, and, and here, the, one, the female on the left is Poppy, and that's her calf, but that's Poppy's younger sister getting all worried because the calf's falling into this <laughs> water hole. And here's another one, another one reaching, reaching back to reassure, that's another aloe mother, it's not its mother, reaching back with its trunk right into the mouth of the other one, or on the mouth, just, it's just all the behavior around these calves has been <coughs> wonderful to watch. And even the youngest, I mean, she's taking, this one's only about three, two and a half, three years old, but she's still already taking care of the calf. And the calves themselves are just so full of the devil. <laughs> These are three of the three calves from Echo's family, and they've just been mud wallowing. And they, there's seven of them in this family, and six of them are male and only one is a female but they they uh, rush around together and they get they just have so much fun and that's 71 saying quahari or goodbye <laughs> and also saying please do anything you can to help us and to keep us keep us going um that's both i and in this case i'm asking you to both uh support pause as well as and the Oakland Zoo and the Amazon Trust for Elephants, not just us. But that's uh, 71 giving you, a, giving you a greeting. So um, I want to just say before, that's, before I close that um, we do have this naming program, it is, and um, if you're interested. But we also, I also have an e-newsletter these days, which uh, goes out about once every two months. And if you want to be on that newsletter, and it's full of great photos and news of what's going on in Amicelli, and, um, you can sign up for it outside on a sign-up sheet. You know, just, it's just all I need is your email, written very clearly, because often people write it very fast and then I, I can't read it. So, uh, so do sign up, because it'd be nice to keep in touch with all of you. We also have a page on Facebook which you can like. Uh, we have a group, but I'm going to discontinue that. We're going to because the page is very nice. It's very interactive, and um, we also post. We've been posting a lot of these photos that you saw of the new calves on the on the Ambassador Trust site, and we sometimes have stories or, or articles or, or whatever. And, and, um, I, and people seem to be enjoying that the, our Facebook page as well. So that's just called the Selling Trust for Elephants page rather than group. And um, that's really where I'm going to end it. And I hope I I just hope to get to talk to some of you afterward. And thank you so much for having this has just been a great turnout of people. And and I really appreciate your your support and your interest in in, in what we're doing. Thank you.